Cult developers aren't created deliberately. Sometimes they might have ideas that were ahead of the times. Sometimes they might partner with a hardware platform that utilizes technologies that haven't caught on yet. Sometimes, due to mismanagement, they might lose talented staff whose stars would rise elsewhere. And sometimes, competition would be so fierce that they wouldn't make the mark that they desired to. For software developers Data West, every single one of these things happened. But that doesn't diminish their remarkable contributions to gaming as a whole. Multiple series spanning every genre you can think of, from adventure to strategy to interactive movies, and a very interesting partnership with an underrated piece of hardware, the Fujitsu FM Towns, that would lead them to become one of the lead developers for that platform, and also cause them to develop one of the first systems for streaming data from CD-ROMs that ever existed. This is the story of Data West, their varied and fascinating library of games, and their relationship to computers and consoles from the late 1980s to the turn of the millennium where a varied library of developed titles and ports would give way to a massive multimedia focus that would attempt to push technology forward years before the competition. But before that, they would have to establish themselves as a software house, and throughout the 1980s, they would develop some very unique titles. Data West started and remains in Osaka, formed in May of 1984, although they didn't fully establish until about two years later. It was formed by Naokazu Akita. Although games were a major part of their output, it wasn't the only thing they were doing, also being involved with custom software design and working in video and sound production. The first titles they developed were pastiches of popular television programs. The actor Hiroshi Kawaguchi, who appeared in more than 50 films from the 1950s to the 1980s, had a series of specials where he would explore various dangerous parts of the world, unraveling the mysteries of deep caves and going on the hunt for cryptids. The game Expedition 1, I Saw a Mysterious Ghost in an Unexplored Cave, released for the FM7 in 1984, was a simple action game inspired by the show. Of more importance, though, was the second title in the series. I Saw a Golden Legend in the Depths of the Devil's Nest in the Amazon was a text adventure in which the player must discover a lost civilization while keeping the ratings high enough to stay on the air. These games were written by Hitoshi Hasebi, who would show up later on as a lead writer for one of their most enduring series. Adventure games would make up a significant portion of Data West's early output, with one such game being Imitation City. Imitation City, released for the PC-88 and Sharp X1, is a cyberpunk adventure game highly inspired by Blade Runner, and would be released one year before Hideo Kojima's Snatcher. This game would have a surprisingly high pedigree. It was written by Jiro Ishii, who would go on to design cult classics such as 428 Shibuya Scramble. At this time, though, he was 19 and working part-time, despite being the main scenario designer and illustrator for this title. Ishii would reflect later on that he felt like this game was a bit of a missed opportunity with studio interference on things like illustrations and story points frustrating him immensely. Despite this, there are still some clever touches that shine through. The design of the game is very bleak. There's no chrome or sheen here in the cyberpunk universe, setting it apart from contemporary works. This is a story about poverty, loss, and the erosion of humanity, and the design reflects that. Unfortunately, Data West didn't agree with this interpretation, and would eventually take the rights away from Ishii, and farm an updated version to another studio. 
who would make it much more sleeker looking and turn it into an arrow gay. Another title of note from this time was an adventure game based on the first Back to the Future movie. This game follows the plot of the film quite closely, although a lot of dead ends could be generated by forgetting to pick up an inventory item or perform a key action. Data West would also release more than just adventure games. For reasons that are unclear, they released two versions of the same pinball title, Television Entertainment Ball and Ball Panicker. They would also try their hand at first-person dungeon crawling with their game Marvelous. Data West would also dabble in strategy with the TDF series. These games, which stand for Terrestrial Defense Force, are turn-based titles that involve protecting the Earth from an army of kaiju. The first game was released for multiple PC systems throughout the late 80s, but the sequel, Golklight, was released exclusively for the PC Engine CD in 1991. They would also branch out into working with other companies, designing adventure games of both the adult and non-adult varieties, the latter being Time Paradox, a collaboration with Hudson, and the former being Golkez, a post-apocalyptic isekai eroge that is terrible. Now at the end of the 1980s, the personal computer market in Japan had expanded considerably. Once thought to be the exclusive domain of hobbyists and businesses, Computers were common enough in homes now that there was a highly rated Sunday morning television program about them. However, the competing computer standards of the time had begun to show their age, and hardware and software manufacturers began to search for the next big thing in order to stay competitive. Data West would have their eye on one of those potential technologies way before their competitors. Multimedia. Specifically, CD-ROM drives. Although we think of CD-ROMs as being from the 1990s, they've actually been around for quite a bit longer, with the first CD-ROM developed in Japan in 1982 by the company Denon. Although it wasn't shown to the public until the first Japanese Comdex in 1985. While they would not be popularized until 1989, Akita and his staff saw great potential in CD-ROM as a medium, and would begin to direct their focus towards utilizing it for software and entertainment. This would remain their primary goal throughout the 1980s and early 1990s. And in pursuit of that goal, Data West would invent a technology called DAPS, the Data West Active Picture System which allowed video to be streamed extremely efficiently from CD-ROMs years before other technologies would do the same thing. This allowed for some interesting partnerships, notably with Kyoto Animation. These partnerships and technologies would allow for titles to be developed with high quality music and sound, far surpassing their competitors. Additionally, when ported to Windows 95 systems later on, the DAP system and its successor, the DCCS system, allowed games to be streamed directly from the CD, skipping large installs. Data West would become so involved with this that they would create and sell their own CD-ROM drive, the DWR-22MS. As this was happening, Fujitsu's main computer line, the FM7, was losing market share to the NEC PC-88, and NEC was also beginning to shift its more powerful business line, the PC-98, to home markets. In order to both combat this and take advantage of some initial weaknesses in graphics and sound in the first PC-98 lines, Fujitsu developed a new computer, the FM Towns, a workstation focused primarily on multimedia and one of the first computers to have a built-in CD-ROM drive. Sensing a way to further the development of multimedia, Data West would partner with Fujitsu, and from that they would develop multiple series with the FM Towns as lead platform, 
starting with the fourth unit. The fourth unit series was already pretty popular, due to several contemporary floppy releases that had gained a bit of a following. Data West would take advantage of that following and change the fourth unit to be their flagship series, starting by taking the first couple of games and putting them in a compilation called Linkage, which is what we'll be taking a look at now. The fourth unit series would go through a good deal of changes over the course of its releases, with the narrative directions and brains behind it changing multiple times. They would also serve as a good example of the changes adventure titles would go through over the course of the early 1990s. Often lumped in with, and marketed as, the shoujo games, a subgroup of games defined as being centered around interactions with attractive women. These games are a bit different than a dating sim, and would actually push back against that definition in their content. They start out as a more typical super-powered girlfriend sort of thing that we've seen many times before, but very quickly change direction, turning into a military thriller and jumping around in tone throughout the entire series. The games also utilize a very simple battle system that's a bit like rock, paper, scissors, where the protagonist can target certain segments of her opponent, choosing between simple punches and kicks, a psychic blast, and a shield. It also introduces one of the more unusual aspects unique to this series. For the most part, you can initiate battle with everyone you meet, including your allies. This will usually result in a game over, but it's amusingly bizarre. Designed by Hitoshi Hasebi, who had been with Data West since the beginning, the fourth unit, Volume 1, tells the story of Bronwyn, an amnesiac young woman found in a UFO crash. Rescued by a local teenager, she finds out that she has mysterious powers and becomes involved in a conflict between a group of bionic soldiers called the Unified Force and a mysterious trade organization called the WWWF. The first game tries to approach a conventional menu adventure game a little differently, adding pixel hunting elements and a long list of commands. This is a little bit of a mixed bag as the vast majority of commands are not used across the course of the game. The tone is light and a bit fan servicey, similar to the Project Echo OVAs. Unique to this entry are multiple endings, depending on which side Bronwyn picks, but there's only one true ending. Although the game's primary designer was Hitoshi Hasebi, Bronwyn herself was designed by the artist Takio Yakushiji who would later go on to write Castlevania Legacy of Darkness for the Nintendo 64. Bronwyn would end up being a popular character, and the fourth unit would go on to have many sequels. Yakushiji would design the characters for the games until Volume 5, where he only did the package art, and he would be replaced by Ishu Nakamura for the final two entries. The fourth unit, Volume 2, picks up and maintains the tone of the first game, but introduces a major antagonist that will be present for the rest of the volumes. Darcy, a young woman that can neutralize Bronwyn's psychic powers. Captured by the WWWF and held prisoner in an enemy base, Bronwyn must foil their plans and escape. Volume 2 manages to retain and streamline the system of the previous game, with better puzzles and more logical combat. It's with the third volume, though, Dual Target, that the style of the series would begin to change drastically. The head developer would shift from Hitoshi Hasebi to Kazuhide Nakamura, and the style would change into something more resembling an interactive movie, where the player can change Bronwyn's response to the events happening around her by selecting her disposition from a menu. Dual Targets continues the story of Bronwyn's fight against the WWWF. This time around, she is trying to prevent them from getting hold of the Psycho Power Booster, a device that gives Bronwyn and her comrades their powers. Darcy is also back, 
this time in control of Sui Zess, an exact duplicate of Bronwyn. And they have begun attacking anyone close to Bronwyn in her private life, including members of Nebula Academy, a nearby school. While still having a kind of cheesecake action girl show feeling, the series now begins to shed its roots, getting a bit more serious and marking a shift from slice of life hijinks to real consequences and raised stakes. The fourth unit, Volume 4, Zero, tries to merge the interactive movie gameplay of the third game with the adventure gaming systems of the first two. Bronwyn can now select from two menus, what option to take and her disposition while taking that option, which changes how people react to her throughout the story. This is thematically tied to the gameplay, as the majority of the game is concerned with her trying to uncover a spy within the unified force. This makes it a detective game of sorts, as Bronwyn will be questioning her friends and allies, and trying to figure out contradictions and lies. The graphics have changed style slightly, marking a shift to a slightly more realistic presentation. And Zero is easily the most difficult game in the series, due to the mystery nature of the plot. This game would bring an end to the WWWF arc and mark a shift towards a more globetrotting spy tone. This tone would be elaborated upon in the next volume, The Again, which sees a newly promoted Bronwyn acting as bodyguard to a VIP while traveling on a train to Switzerland, and fighting against a new organization called Einheit, made up of WWWF remnants. Bronwyn gets a love interest in this one, affable German secret agent August Hoffer, who provides a bit of light comedy from the culture clash between him and Bronwyn. Bronwyn will also get some answers as to her past and her initial amnesia, and what exactly she and the other bionic soldiers in her unit really are. Darcy returns, this time as more of a wild card than an antagonist, chased by Einheit assassins. D again is solid, with a very even tone that mixes seriousness and comedy quite deftly. Despite the successes of the previous titles, the fourth unit would change its whole systems yet again for the final two entries in the series. The first of these, Merry-Go-Round, would be the first to introduce speech to the games, and also the first to utilize the DAP system. It also introduces a brand new gameplay system similar to dual targets, but now with a time limit and lives. Most of the game is a very straightforward interactive movie, and at times the plot will stop and the player will have to select from a menu below. Get it wrong and you lose life. Get it right and the movie continues, all while a timer tracks down. The animations are quite good due to the new systems, but the choice wheel under pressure is a bit frustrating due to load times being high when selecting an option. Quite frankly, the menus load much slower than the animations, making this game not that much fun to play. Prior to the release of Merry-Go-Round, demo play sessions were conducted at Fujitsu Plaza Sapporo, as well as lectures conducted by the musician Yasuhito Saito who would compose the music for the entire fourth unit series, as well as be a general PR man for Data West. In addition, if a user registration postcard was sent in after buying the game, the player would receive a bonus CD-ROM with a store demo of the game, an explanation of the DAP system, and some timelines and appendixes about the world of the fourth unit, narrated by the voice actor for one of the characters, Zero Two Nucleon. Despite the publicity efforts, Merry-Go-Round wouldn't sell well, and there would be only one more release in the fourth unit series before Data West would retire it. The fourth unit, Wyatt, would repeat the systems of Merry-Go-Round, although the timer would be removed, and tell the story of Bronwyn and her comrades trying to stop a laser satellite. Although it retained a similar menu system to Dual Target, the game is somehow even easier, and the gameplay is just rather poor. At that point, though, interest in the series had burned out, 
and people had moved on to other series and machines. Because of that, this would be the last we'd hear of Bronwyn. After deciding to focus on the FM towns, Data West would also create other adventure game series, the most elaborate of which was the Psychic Detective series. These CD-ROM-only titles tell the story of Kazuya Furuyagi, a detective with the ability to delve into people's minds and either relive or implant their memories. It also tells the story of his involvement with Reika, a woman with mysterious supernatural ties who he will lose and reconnect with multiple times over the course of the series. Kazuya has many of his own secrets and demons, particularly involving a lost love or guilt over his own actions has caused him to be haunted by her memory. Over the course of seven games, we will learn the truth about his past, the true nature of his lost love Aya, and Reika's connection to everything. Of particular note in these games are the striking artwork and illustrations. Although these games can get very gory, as Kazuya spends most of his time in people's heads where nightmare logic rules the day, the detailed character art, incredible package design, and gorgeous hand-drawn backgrounds, all done in most cases by still photographer and painter Yoshiko Miyamoto, remain excellent throughout. The first case, Invitation, is a time-sensitive mystery where Kazuya is called in to investigate the reasons for a young girl's coma by her mysterious family. Kazuya must work against the clock and unravel long-buried family secrets to save the young girl, Asami. The second case, Memories, involves Kazuya, now mourning a breakup with Reika, getting involved with a request to erase a client's memory of their father. Kazuya will jump into the memories of multiple people this time, peering into different time periods, and gaining allies that will stick around for the rest of the series. Unusually for this series, this time around the backgrounds were photographic instead of drawn. Case 3, Aya, more directly involves Kazuya's past. He has resolved things with Reika, but after a friend hires him to verify the tumor of an old man, the detective falls into a trap involving his deceased ex Aya and her extremely powerful father, threatening the safety of Reika and both of their allies. On top of everything, Kazuya must solve the mystery of a woman's ghost trying to avenge her own murder all while trying to maintain his sanity. Yoichi Yamada would be one of the lead designers of this game, and he is now a programmer highly tied to the Zelda and Pikmin series. The jump in quality from his work is notable, and he would also be joined by Kenji Nakamura on other technical duties. And Kenji Nakamura would go on to direct many WWE games later on in the back half of the 2010s. The fourth case, Orgel, is the story of Kazuya being summoned to yet another mysterious mansion, this time the house of an insane architect. A mysterious doll has been passed down from his wife's family for many generations, and according to his will, five people will be invited to the house, all with their own reasons for wanting the doll. Hired by the architect's wife, Kazuya will have to solve the mysteries of everyone's past, and delve into the guest's minds as murders begin to occur and the bodies begin to pile up. Case 5, Nightmare, starts with Kazuya, now reunited and living with Reika, having a terrible dream about a woman in a tower. After witnessing in the dream what he believes to be a ritualistic sacrifice, he seeks the help of another friend of Reika's, Father Rodriguez, a shady priest who had saved Kazuya towards the end of Volume 2, Memories. The DAP system is extremely impressive in this title, with over 2,500 animations being loaded from the disc. Solitude, the final case, 
was actually so large it was split across two releases. This game bridges all previous plot threads together. Information gained by Kazuya at the end of Nightmare has revealed that everything he thought he knew about his past was a total lie. And he is beginning to finally make progress on learning the secrets of Aya, Reika, the links between them and their families, and secret experiments commissioned by the country's wealthy involving psychic powers. All mysteries are revealed as the game hurtles towards its dark conclusion. The animation quality of the series is the highest it has ever been here, with support work performed by Kyoto Animation, who had worked on and off this series up to this point. This causes the game to have a high point aesthetically, but this being a very twisty noir plot, even with flashbacks, explanations, and additional scenes talking about character motivations and hidden plot points, the plot just doesn't hold together as tautly as it should, even though the atmosphere and especially the supporting characters remain incredibly strong. The psychic detective games are overall pretty good, with Aya, Orgel, and Nightmare as standouts. Data West would actually put most of their marketing on these three titles, and would work on porting them to the PC Engine and Sega CD, as well as buying a large advertising presence in multiple issues of Beep Mega Drive magazine, with Yasuhito Saito penning multiple write-ups advertising the series. Unfortunately, this massive advertising expansion would not result in an increase in sales, and the PC Engine and Sega CD ports of Nightmare would end up not being released. It's easy to see why the games, while well constructed, might not have mainstream appeal. For one, there are some very frustrating flaws in the series that act as somewhat of a barrier to entry. For example, the game series is obsessed with intricate mansions turning most of them into illogical mazes that take hours to navigate through. Kazoya himself also is unrelentingly grim as a protagonist. His observations on everything from characters to natural objects like cicadas and street signs are almost constant, fatalistic, hard-boiled noir narration, which can get old after a while. On the other hand, the games all have a skillfully crafted and haunting atmosphere. One trick the game utilizes is that it is set in Tokyo, but it uses photographs and designs of European cities and mansions that are mixed in, giving everything a dreamlike, surreal quality because nothing ever feels like where it is supposed to be. Houses and streets aren't laid out logically in these games, and everyone you meet is just a little bit off. This would not be the only detective series by Data West for the FM Towns. Ms. Detective, a duology about a junior detective investigating multiple crimes, is quite different from the Psychic Detective games, with a much lighter tone and easier gameplay. Despite being FMV games, the acting in these are fairly grounded and that helps the game's atmosphere, similar to contemporary TV crime dramas. The Miss Detective games are oddly cozy. The protagonist is incredibly affable, a breath of fresh air from Kazuya's constant monologuing. The more relaxed tone of these games, as well as their increased accessibility, led to the Miss Detective series having significantly better sales on PC than the Psychic Detective games. Although junior detective Chisato Hagari would be a popular character, though not as popular as Bronwyn, she would only be in these two releases. Yet another detective series released by Data West were the Misty games, which have some interesting differences across the platforms they were released on. For the most part, they were more traditional black and white text adventures with some still images which tell the story of a young detective, Ryu Kamashiro, working in Tokyo and solving multiple small cases ranging from thefts to complex murders. These games were released monthly, 
with each game having around half a dozen cases in them over a course of roughly seven months. The small size of the game and text focus allowed the Misty games to be ported to practically every contemporary computer system on the market at the time. However, there is one significantly different port worth taking a further look at, and that is again for the FM Towns. The FM Towns port of the game is much more advanced, having hand-drawn graphics, better music, and a redesigned map. The quality of life improvements here give the game a better overall feel, but ultimately, it depends on what you're looking for. Fans of older text adventures and wanting a more realistic approach would be very happy with the PC-98 and other ports of Misty. And fans of a more stylized approach, or later period adventure games, would find themselves very much at home with the FM Towns version. Data West would have only one other major in-house adventure game release for the FM Towns, and that would be Shamhat, the Holy Circlet, a historical adventure game in which an archaeology professor is investigating artifacts that he believes are related to the Epic of Gilgamesh. By utilizing DCCS, a slightly different version of DAPS that allowed for streaming of a decent amount of polygons from the CD, something that Data West had started to do in a very limited way towards the end of the Psychic Detective games. Shamhat has a lot of animations that show the characters moving through a polygonal 3D environment. While this was a perfectly competent game, the market was beginning to shift, and Data West would have to change their output to keep up. It was around this time that the race between the FM Towns and the PC-98 would come to an end, and sadly, Fujitsu was not the winner here. Although they had managed to successfully capitalize on early versions of the PC-98 not having optimal multimedia capability, NEC's continued improvement of PC-98 models would eventually cause it to surpass Fujitsu entirely and completely outsell the FM Towns. With sales of their lead platform dropping, Data West would respond to this by adjusting their strategy. Instead shifting themselves to be a porting studio for licensed titles for other companies. As well as changing their focus to making their own ports and releases for consoles and for Windows 95. This would cause some of their releases to change platforms midstream. The Rise Amber series, a trilogy of space shooters designed by Kazuhiri Nakamura from the 4th Unit Parts 3 and 4, would start out on the FM Towns, but switch to the PC Engine CD for the final two entries. These are horizontally scrolling space shooters similar to R-Type, with the player controlling a lone ship against the Zul Empire. The designs are a bit biomechanical and HR Giger inspired, but they don't go as far as something like Life Force. Well, perfectly good games, they simply don't reach the height of their competitors, at least until the greatly improved final title. That being said, the games have some interesting features and improvements across releases. The first release is very standard, but the second has an incredible sense of speed, setting it apart from contemporary competitors. And the third game has great visual designs an amazing difficulty balance, as opposed to the relentless challenge of the first two games. One of the more surprising aspects of this era was that Data West, forever in pursuit of technological advancement, would partner with the Pioneer Laser Active, a rare and expensive hybrid Laserdisc player and video game console. For this system, they would develop the Vajra games, Two 3D rail shooters similar to games like Sylphie or Rebel Assault, but much more advanced. Other than those, Data West would focus on contributing to licensed ports of titles from various anime franchises, utilizing their experience with the FM Towns while still focusing on development for other consoles. This included a PC FX adventure game based on the Ah My Goddess franchise, and another licensed title for the same system based on the Cutie Honey franchise. They would also work on porting an FM Towns version of a popular submarine simulator based on the anime The Silent Service. 
One notable port from this time is Tanjo Debut, based on an OVA from 1994. Tanjo Debut is a management simulator where you must help a group of young women become an incredibly popular idol band. You have to schedule their trainings, book events, and keep their spirits high. The management aspect of this game is surprisingly difficult, with very little room for error, as the band will very quickly become tired or angry if you make a simple mistake. Data West would also try their hand at developing titles for the Sony PlayStation, one of which was Brave Prove, an action RPG about a young hero and his love, heavily inspired by Squaresoft games and Super Famicom titles. Although the game is quite vibrant and plays well, it did not review well at time of release, with Famitsu giving it only a 20. Despite all that, it's one of the few Data West games that has a working fan translation. They would also try to create a top-down shooter, similar to Commando, called Bounty Arms. But unfortunately, all that would be completed of that was a demo, and the final game would never see release. One of the more bizarre releases of the last years of Data West as a software developer was Mayu. Mayu is an experimental sound novel that was initially released as a demo download on Data West's website. For about $14, someone would send in money and get a CD with a slightly longer version of Mayu, as well as many promotional materials for Data West's other games. Mayu is extremely creepy and also extremely short. It tells the story of a young girl wrestling with caring for their grandmother and feeling trapped like a moth in a box. As Windows 95 was adopted into the Japanese computer industry, the PC landscape changed irrevocably. Attempting to keep up with this change, Fujitsu would be caught up in this, modifying the FM Towns models to work as PC clones, and eventually abandoning that line entirely and replacing it with the FMV, a much more traditional PC. Data West would also try to capitalize on this by porting upgraded versions of all of the Psychic Detective games to Windows 95. These ports, despite their improvements, just didn't sell as well as their initial releases. That, combined with the poor sales of earlier console ports, the games of theirs that didn't make it across the finish line, the release of some of their games on very hard-to-find systems, and the repeated issue of employees leaving due to constant shifting of teams and executive meddling, would finally push Data West out of the software industry for good. From that point onward, and up until now, they specialized in car GPS devices, although they still retained some staff with experience as software developers. In 2020, Data West would do something about this. The website D Again came online as a store, releasing legacy Data West titles, primarily focusing on the Psychic Detective games. Also, in interviews with Japanese magazines, representatives of Data West stated their plans to release more ports of earlier games patched to run on modern systems. Additionally, if the titles sold well enough, they planned to bring back Bronwyn, their most popular character, in a new game. Data West is an interesting case. It's a company that was consistently almost famous, but unusual business decisions, especially their ability to recruit and then lose incredibly talented personnel, kept them just out of the limelight. The systems that they focused on never truly became market dominant, and their very expensive marketing blitzes never got the sales that they wanted on their titles. However, the technologies that they developed were extraordinary, and Data West pushed multimedia forward with every single title they created. Hopefully in the future, as D again begins to reissue these titles, more people will discover the very unique and technically advanced games from this consistently underrated but fascinating company. See you next time.